Okay, welcome for the last day. And what's the best way to start the last day than with a, a computation with Pier Paolo? So please go ahead. So just uh, today we'll, we'll speed up, uh, I, I'll shorten a bit the pauses uh, and also the lunch because there are uh, strikes for the buses as you may have seen. So we'll try all to catch the last bus to, to go in town. So we have to finish before, let's say 15 minutes before, uh, before 4 p.m. Okay. So just follow my lead when I say, ah, we go inside <laughs> and uh, all right, <laughs> let's try to keep, uh, to keep it in time today, for today. <laughs> I, I promise. All right. Okay. Thanks very much. And uh, welcome, uh, welcome back to the uh, last couple of hours on the uh, Procrastis uh, problem. So I, I took the liberty to, um, to fill the blackboard uh, already with, with a short uh, summary because there's been uh, a, a large gap uh, in, in the lectures. So maybe just to refresh your memory. So we are considering the following uh, problem. So we have a system of uh, linear uh, equations. Uh, we have m equations in n uh, unknowns. And this system is random in the sense that the matrix of coefficients, uh, which is re rectangular, is random. And the, the known term on the right hand side is also random with the, with the noise. So the, the variance of the uh, elements, the elements are centered and the variance is equal to sigma, this, the parameter sigma square. Okay. And there is a nonlinear constraint on the space of, uh, of solutions. So the, the solutions need to live uh, on the sphere of radius, uh, of radius n. We define the parameter alpha, which is the rectangularity uh, parameter. It is the ratio between the number of equations and the number of, of unknowns. And we introduce a, a loss function that I call uh, h. Uh, it is essentially the quadratic norm of, of the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So in general, if this loss function is exactly equal to zero, then it means that the system of equation is, is compatible in the sense that we can, uh, we can find a, a solution, obviously given this, this constraint. If it is strictly larger than zero, then the system is incompatible in the sense that in general, we cannot find a, a solution that satisfies the system uh, exactly. And this loss function quantifies how, how wrong your, your putative solution uh, is, okay? Now, um, we want to compute, of course, the, the relevant uh, figure of merit is the minimal, is the minimal loss that, that I call uh, E-min. And, uh, and this minimal loss is provided using a so-called replica analysis, which is, of course, uh, heuristics. It, it, is, uh, it is not rigorous. It is provided by Rachel uh, Tublin and, and Jan Fyodorov in a couple of papers uh, that I linked, that I listed on the uh, handout and in uh, in the uh, PhD thesis of, of Rachel, uh, who is also available uh, online, and that I strongly suggest um, that you that you have a look uh, at. It contains a lot a lot more material that I will uh, be able to cover today. So the the way the, the system the, the the setup works is you define a partition function z, introducing a fictitious temperature. Uh, beta, so you integrate over the putative solutions. Uh, the Boltzmann, uh, the Gibbs Boltzmann weight, exponential of minus beta h, the loss, the loss function. In the limit beta to infinity, this object is supposed to uh, to converge to exponential of minus beta, dominated by the minimal solution, the minimal loss here. So if you invert this relation, you have that the minimal the minimal loss is given by minus the limit beta to infinity of one over beta, the average of log z, where of course we take into account the random nature of, of the problem. So we, we also average the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So the technical issue is how do we uh, average the logarithm of this uh, partition function over the disorder encoded in the coefficients, in the random coefficients of A and in the random entries of, uh, of B. And to do that, we, we use the uh, so-called replica trick, which, uh, which means that we are going to use a, a mathematically correct identity uh, in, in the wrong way, 
meaning that we are going to, to take the limit n to zero of one over n log of z to the n, where of course little n uh, must be uh, computed in the vicinity of zero. But first we are going to assume that little n is, is an integer. So we are going to promote little n to, to an integer so that essentially we are, uh, the task is to compute the average of a replicated version, uh, little n times an integer of the partition function z. Why this is useful? Because a replicated integral, which is, which is z, is nothing but a larger integral. And that, uh, that, that, that what, what makes the computation uh, possible. So we can exchange the integration over replicated variables x and the integrations over a and b. So we can perform the, the average over the disorder first, which, which we cannot do if we have a logarithm in, in, in between. Okay, so this is the calculation that we did uh, last time, and we, we ended up uh, with the expression here on, on the right hand side, forgetting uh, normalization constants that anyway will, will not play a role in the large capital N uh, limit. Uh, this is the integral that we, we ended up uh, uh, having. It is a nice, nice integral because it has uh, a form of exponential minus capital N into uh, some, some function phi. This function phi uh, acts on uh, uh, matrices uh, of size uh, uh, n by n. And uh, these matrices are matrix, matrices Q. Mm, they, they have a diagonal that is, uh, all the elements on the diagonal are equal to one. And the explicit expression is given by this difference of log deaths, okay? Where the parameter alpha appears in here, the rectangularity parameter. And in general, we, we did the derivation for a general function uh, f. Um, for, for our problem, the function f has a particularly simple form. It is sigma squared plus uh, u. Uh, should you start from, from a different, uh, different setting, uh, you can consider in here, uh, for example, a polynomial in, uh, in, uh, in u. This would correspond to essentially a system of nonlinear equations with, with a nonlinear constraint. Okay, and the problem becomes much more much more difficult. But for for special instances uh, of this problem, uh, this has been considered by Rachel in her in her thesis. So there is a chapter devoted to uh, to, to this more general class of problem. Okay, so now uh, I mm, uh, I can start from from here. So I will I will keep this uh, this term here because that's the starting point, and I will erase the summary. Uh, unless there are there are questions, of course, and feel free to interrupt me if uh... there is a question by Anas on the chat. Uh, can the n little the replica limit little n going to zero can be anal analytically continued? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I would say that I, I'd be very happy first to, to be able to answer this question and, and I'd be very happy to duck the question entirely at this, at this point. Uh, so essentially, mathematically, that's the whole, that, that's the whole uh, um, issue. Um, so we, we cannot mathematically prove, uh, I mean, some of these results can be proved rigorously using alternative methods, typically, or using rigorous versions. Uh, so in some sense, uh, the question should be more properly be asked to, uh, to Jean. Um, so uh, we, we, we don't know. The, the answer is that we, we don't know whether this is, this is true. We, we need to assume that the calculation that we do for little n, uh, an integer, can be meaningfully continued in the vicinity of, uh, uh, of zero. That, that's the, the heuristic and non-rigorous nature of the, of the method. So I, I don't have a more, uh, I, I wish I had, but I don't have a more um, convincing um, answer, unfortunately. 
uh, I, I believe for this specific uh, problem, no, not, not yet. Um, some result, and I will discuss this briefly in the second part, uh, some results have been made rigorous for a closely related uh, problem, where essentially you use this very same uh, techniques, and the problem uh, is uh, in, instead of minimizing that loss function, what, what you're interested in is some form of uh, like quadratic form uh, problems with uh, like some sort of magnetic magnetic field. So you have something like like this. So you, you have a preferential direction and, uh, and you have a quadratic form where you take the W and the H as, as random. So this is, this is a related somehow problem, at least methodologically, for which uh, there is a rigorous uh, analysis. And, and this is very interesting because the rigorous analysis in some region disagrees with, with, the, replica, with the replica result. So this is a, this is a very, uh, very important playground to test the limits of the, of, the replica, of the replica trick, because we have there the rare luxury of having also an exact rigorous results. For the procrastinus problem, I don't believe there is uh, yet. So, okay. So, for for large n, we start from this uh, this integral. For large n, we the, this integral lends itself to a Laplace or saddle point uh, approximation. So, this integral will be dominated by the configurations of of Q such that phi n of Q is minimized. So, uh, as usual, we assume that Zn for, for large capital N will be dominated by the configurations of Q such that phi N is minimized. And uh, Q min is then argmin, so it is the matrix that minimizes phi n of, of q. This, this step already entails uh, some, some mathematically uh, itchy uh, procedure because we are taking the limit, essentially the limit capital N to infinity first. So we, we are in some sense exchanging already limits. So the order of limits would be little n to zero, beta to infinity, and then something about capital N. And here we are already doing something not completely um, legit, but that's, uh, that's the, only, the only thing we can, we can do. So if we take now the limit N to infinity of what? The limit N to infinity of the average E min over N, then we get that this is given by the limit beta to infinity, one over two beta, the limit n to zero, one over n phi n of q min. So I'm just combining the, uh, the replica trick the beta to infinity and the fact that we, we have to take the logarithm of the average of Zn and the logarithm of the average of Zn will give the logarithm of exponential of minus n over two phi n at q min. And that, that explains the appearance of this extra factor of two. Yeah. Okay, so now the, the task is to compute the matrix Q that minimizes this, uh, this object. Okay. So we want to, uh, to find the solution of this uh, minimum uh, problem. So we need to differentiate the function phi n over the entries of the matrix uh, AB for all A smaller than B. So Q is, is symmetric and has a, a constraint on the diagonal being equal to one. So this is the general structure of the matrix, uh, of the matrix Q. So, well, okay, let me write it like this. 
Okay, the, the, uh, is, is it clear why the diagonal must be equal to, to one? Uh, it is because the, the definition of QAB was uh, something like X, uh, A dot XB divided by, by N. So on the diagonal, we have uh, in the numerator, the norm square of the vector X, which is by construction, by definition, is equal to N, okay? Because we live on the sphere. So on the diagonal, we need to have ones. Good. So in order to do this, uh, this uh, derivative, we, we need to calculate the derivative of these log deaths here and, and here. So we need to use an identity which is uh, which I reported in the handouts. It is equation 20 in the uh, handouts. And the identity is as follows. The derivative with respect to a matrix element, AB, of the log that of a matrix M is equal to the element BA of the matrix M to the minus one of the inverse inverse matrix. And uh, well, I don't have time to, to sketch the, the proof, but I linked uh, like a nice proof on the, on the internet. You can find many of, many of them, but it, it is a very compact, uh, there is a very compact proof. So if, if you trust this, this result, we can proceed by applying this, this identity and differentiate this, uh, this function. Okay, so when we differentiate minus log that Q, we get the inverse, the, a certain element of the inverse of Q. So we get Q minus one elements AB with, with a minus sign, but I, I move it to the, other, to the other side. So this is equal to what? Is equal to alpha. And then there is a log that of this, of this object. I'm, I'm already putting myself in this specific, in this specific uh, setting, okay, not not for general, not for general f. So we we will get an extra beta because we need to differentiate use, using the chain rule and differentiate inside the argument of the determinant. So we get an extra beta, and then we get the inverse matrix of that object plus beta of q plus Sigma square E N minus one element A B where the E N matrix is the matrix with all ones. It's it's a rank one matrix which is, which is filled by, by one. Where does, does this come from? It comes from this sigma square in the function, okay? This sigma square is not multiplying the identity. It is multiplying every single element. So we need to include this, this, uh, this matrix in, in there, okay? Good, and the dimension here is little, little n, okay? Now, in order to solve this matrix, uh, this matrix uh, equation, what people do is they make an ansatz for the structure of the matrix uh, Q. The simplest ansatz that you can that you can make is the so-called uh, replica symmetric uh, ansatz or uh, RSB. RS, B in the case it doesn't work. So, so the, the way the, the game works is you start with the, with the simplest possible, possible answers, which is this replica symmetric that I'm going to, to describe. If everything goes through without problems, then you assume that, okay, maybe we got the right answers. If at some point you get some inconsistency, then this might be a signal that your initial answers is not correct and you need to do something uh, a bit more, um, um, a bit more uh, sophisticated, a bit more subtle, okay? That's a very, you know, 
simple and, and fast explanation of, of the whole of the whole business. But let's let's try with the simplest the simplest replica symmetric ansatz. What does this mean? It means that you are considering that all the replicas, so all the elements of this matrix uh, Q are identical. So remember the indices A and, and B would uh, index the replicas, the replicas that you have uh, that you have here. That's why they go from one to, to little n. And the idea here is that there should not be a difference between whether you call a replica the replica number two or the replica number 17. They should all be equivalent. And this corresponds to putting the same value uh, q in the as the off diagonal element of this uh, of this matrix. Okay. So if you do that, uh, what you need to compute is the inverse matrix of of this of this guy uh, here, and uh, you can do it in in several ways. The, the faster way is to assume a structure of this type for the matrix uh, inverse, and then to compute the parameter uh, gamma and eta by imposing that q minus one times q must be equal to the identity. This gives two equations for the parameters gamma and, and eta. This is simple, simple algebra, so I will just give, uh, give the, uh, the result. I'm not erase here, even though, okay, maybe, yeah. Oops. Yeah. Uh, if, if sorry, if you if we had assumed that Q was, Q was uh, from the beginning, yeah, I'm I'm just yeah I'm just doing it for like pedagogical. I'm going a bit slower for pedagogical reasons. So like this at this at this stage everything is like totally general. Then we make we make an answer, and uh, I, I I appreciate that there are faster way to to do that. But uh, I just I just thought I would give all the um, all the steps. Um, okay. So this uh, leads to the following uh, equations for uh, so the following values for gamma and eta. Let me just report them for uh, completeness. So it's one minus Q, uh, one plus Q times N minus one. And then we have eta, which is minus Q divided by one minus Q, the same thing. One plus Q, N minus one. Okay, so these these are the, the values of the diagonal and off diagonal elements of the inverse matrix Q obtained by imposing that Q minus one Q must be equal to the identity. So you impose this condition, you get two equations, solve the equation, get this results. Good. And now we need to find the inverse of the uh, R matrix our matrix is the, the matrix on the uh, right hand side. So it is identity N plus beta obviously assuming that Q has the same the same structure. Okay. So what, what is the form of the matrix uh, R? So on the diagonal you have uh, one plus beta, then you have the diagonal element of Q, which is one plus sigma squared times one, right? And we call this number R diagonal. Okay. On the off diagonal, you have zero plus beta, Q plus sigma square. And we call, and all, all these elements are identical to this one, and, and here is the same. And we call this object 
R. Okay. So the, the matrix on the right hand side here, for which we need to compute the inverse, has the same the same structure, more or less as Q, apart from the fact that the diagonal element is different from, from one, but it is still diagonal and all the other elements are identical to, to each other. So essentially we can play the same, the same trick. We, uh, we, we say that the matrix R to the minus one is rho D and rho. We, we assign these two values and then we impose that R to the minus one times R is the identity and we find the values for Rho and, and Rho, okay. Rho D and, and Rho. And if you do that, of course, you get, you get uh, an expression that is very similar to this one and reduces to this one when, when RD is equal to one. So what you get, I'm plugging it here, you get that Rho D is RD plus R and minus two. times Rd minus R, Rd plus R n minus one. And rho is minus R divided by Rd minus R, Rd plus R n minus one. Okay. So, so we have the expressions for the diagonal and off-diagonal elements of, uh, of this uh, matrix R to the minus one. Now we need to impose the equality between the off-diagonal elements, right? Because remember, A must be smaller than B. And if we do that, okay, let's keep it there. you get the following, uh, you get eta with a, with a minus sign. So this is the off diagonal element of Q to the minus one. So with, okay, there, there will be a minus sign, okay? And this must be equal to the off diagonal element. So to alpha times beta, times the off diagonal element of the matrix R to the minus one is R. And the off diagonal element of R to the minus one is rho. So it is minus, minus R divided by RD minus R, RD plus R n minus one. You agree? But now R, is this guy here. So it is beta Q plus sigma square. And RD is one plus beta one plus sigma square minus R minus beta Q plus sigma square. And then here you have RD, which is one plus beta one plus sigma square plus r beta q plus sigma square times n minus one. So you have an equality that fixes the optimal value of q in such a way that this subtle point condition is, is verified. So this is, a, this is an equation that needs to be solved for Q and it involves all the parameters of the model, the replica parameter that needs to be sent to, to zero, the beta temperature that needs to be sent to infinity, the alpha, the rectangularity index and sigma square, the variance of the noise. Everything is, is in here. And if we solve for Q, we get the optimal, the optimal matrix that satisfies this, uh, this condition. Okay, now let's, let's leave this, uh, this condition here for, for a moment. And let's go back to our function phi. 
Remember, we need to compute our function phi at Q min, this, this matrix with a particular replica symmetric structure. Let's do that. Sorry, yeah. Uh, I uh, so th there is uh, there is a um, there is a reason. So let me just. Uh, they 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 do yes. Um, uh, sorry, I I think I think that's uh, that's the um, that's the reason. Let me let me just check my my notes and um, I'll I'll get back to you. But but it is true that the diagonal condition, the off diagonal conditions, I are consistent because I checked it. Okay. Yes. So um, I think I think there is yeah there is a reason of simplicity or some in in some sense you you can probably pick whatever you uh, whatever you want. But um, yeah, let me just think about that and. Uh, um, so we need to compute phi n evaluated at uh, q min. Um, and um, now, actually, probably the, the answer is because in the end, you want q min, uh, you want q min in, in here, right? But q min has the same structure as a generic q. So the diagonal elements is fixed, right? So we, we don't care because we know that cumin will have will have the term a equal to b fixed to one. So so what you what, your freedom is really in the off diagonal elements. This said, the diagonal condition is still compatible with the off diagonal. Yeah, no, no, it's It's in elements of uh, Q. And diagonal elements of Q minus one might have Q and they do. Yeah. So the fact that there is no little Q in the diagonal capital Q in phi does not mean that it is very matrix. Sure, that's 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 true. Yes, yes. So they but must be compatible. That, and they are yes, because uh, because I made sure that I checked it. So okay, I think we are more or less happy with with this uh, consistency check okay so um cumin as uh as this structure then and q here where this q we should call it q star if you want this q is a solution of this of this equation it's not a generic q okay so phi n of cumin is minus log that of the matrix Q plus alpha log that of the matrix uh, the right hand side So in order to proceed, we need to, to know how the these two determinants uh, what they are what they are equal to, and for this there is uh, there is a, a, a nice result that I uh, gave in equation twenty one of the handout that if you have a determinant of a matrix uh, of this type, this determinant is equal to uh, gamma minus eta n minus one gamma plus n minus one uh, eta. Okay, so all you have to do is to plug this formula in uh, in in here, in here, and just massage a bit the uh, the the final result. If you do that, uh, you get. I'm, I'm just quoting the result for the uh, lack of time but it's really simple. There is a question. Okay. So should we not compute the limit of replicas n going to zero 
for phi n of q before finding the equation for little q. Otherwise, q would depend on n, the number of replicas. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can you you can do both. The the, the two strategy would would commute. You can you can first compute it like in full generality and then take the limit here at the level of the subtle point equation yes. and then plug it plug it back or do the other yes. the other the other way the the they're the same yeah they are the same okay so so this is the expression of my function uh, pi n at at q min that depends on on this q on little n, on beta, and on uh, sigma square. And now, as uh, as has been suggested, uh, we can we can take the replica limit. So we can compute the limit n to zero of one over n. Phi n of q. And at the same time, we can compute the off diagonal condition in the limit, the equality by off diagonal condition. Uh, I mean, the equality for Q. Okay, so you, you need to take the expression that I very wisely just erased and, and, and take the limit, uh, the limit n to zero there and you get an equation for Q which simplifies drastically it is Q one minus Q square equal to alpha beta square q plus sigma square divided by one plus beta minus beta q squared. So that, that's the condition that, that you get by taking this limit, but this is very really trivial. It, it just kills uh, a bunch of terms in, in the previous, uh, previous equality. And this is, what, this is what survives, okay? What, uh, what we have uh, here instead is, okay, you see, uh, there is a one over n, so this n gets killed and the, the remaining term survives. So we have alpha log of one plus beta minus beta q, right? And then there is like a log of one plus something small, so in the limit n to n to zero, this log of one plus something small goes as the something small, the beta q plus uh, sigma square n divided by one plus beta one minus q. Okay, so this n is canceled out by this n and what survives is plus alpha beta q plus sigma square divided by one plus beta one minus Q, right? This N is killed by this, by this N. So what survives is minus log of one minus Q. And here we play the same trick. So we have minus Q divided by one minus Q. Let me check if I got it right. E... Yes. Do you agree? So all the terms are of the correct order in little n, which is killed by this one over n in the formula for the uh, e-min. Okay, now we, we got the uh, off diagonal condition to analyze and we need to analyze this object and the off diagonal condition in the further limit beta to infinity. Remember, we have this double, double limit, n to zero, and then afterwards, 
uh, beta to infinity. And that's where the situation becomes uh, more, uh, more interesting. So in the limit uh, beta to infinity, let's look at this uh, off diagonal condition first. So what happens on the right hand side, we have a beta square on the numerator, and then we have a beta square downstairs. Okay, so the right hand side tends to a finite, finite limit in the limit beta to, to infinity. Okay, and we have that the condition is Q one minus Q square goes as alpha Q plus sigma square. And what, what remains uh, downstairs is just one minus Q squared, right? So with, with some caveats, but I will, I will tell you later. So uh, I'll erase here. So this gives uh, an equation for Q that can be solved uh, easily. And Q becomes equal to alpha, the rectangularity index, sigma square divided by uh, one, minus, uh, one minus alpha. And uh, uh, this, uh, this is nice. It depends on the rectangularity index and on sigma, but there is, there is a problem. Uh, the problem is that uh, is it inside the definition of the matrix Q. The diagonal elements are ones because this is a dot uh, product between X and itself. So it has a norm one, but this Q must be a dot product itself, right? Between a vector X and another vector, vector X. And, and there, these are normalized by N. So the scalar product cannot be larger than one between these two vectors. So there is a further condition that is that we need to impose that this Q, so alpha sigma square over one minus alpha must be smaller or at most equal, but let me put this in, uh, in uh, with, let's assume first that this is strictly smaller than one. And if we do that, this imposes a condition that alpha must be smaller than a critical value, one over one plus sigma square, which is smaller than one if the noise is finite. Okay, so the situation in, in alpha is that there is a critical value alpha critical, then there is the value one, and, uh, and, and we can say something for alpha smaller than alpha critical, in, in which case, the, the optimal value of Q is strictly smaller than one, okay? So what, what we, we do, if Q is strictly smaller than, than one, then we need to, uh, then we have that the limit N to zero of one over N phi N of Q min. For beta to infinity, so we need to take this, this guy here, in the limit beta to infinity with Q uh, understood to be strictly smaller than one, okay? So if, uh, if we do that, uh, well, we have a one, one over beta that, that kills uh, here. So everything is of the form alpha log beta one minus Q plus some function of Q of order one. And if you divide this by two beta, this term on the right-hand side goes to zero. So all I'm saying is that in the limit beta to infinity, assuming that Q is strictly smaller than one, this object divided by one over beta goes to zero. All terms are killed. This tends to, to zero. And the consequence of this is that for alpha smaller than alpha critical, which leads to Q being strictly smaller than one, then the average value of E min of the loss function divided by N goes to zero. So the system in this, in this regime is typically or on average compatible. 
Remember, this, this alpha is the rectangularity index. It is smaller than a number smaller than one. So this is a system that is strongly undercomplete. Okay. We have many more unknowns than equations. And, uh, and so it is probably not surprising that, that the, the system is typically compatible. But, but there, is, there is a region here where we have an undercomplete system where something else might, might be happening. This is an interesting region. We have fewer equations than, than variables, but due to the nonlinear nonlinearity of the constraint, something different is, uh, is happening. Um, how can we can we access this area? And then I, I stop. Um, uh, I can uh, I can now. I can we how can we access this uh, other regime? Well, we can access it by uh, noting that uh, this relation might be saturated when, when we impose that Q is strictly equal to one, which of course, for, for, this, for this situation, I, I, could not, uh, I could not simply simply do this, right? Because Q equal to one creates a problem in the denominators. So in, in the limit when Q goes to one, we need, we need to assume that something uh, different happens to beta. So we cannot take the limit Q going to one and the limit beta to infinity separately. So we need to assume that Q goes to one and beta goes to infinity in such a way that the combination beta one minus Q is uh, finite to a certain value V. In that situation, when Q is frozen to its um, largest possible value, which is equal to one, something else happened. And, and we, can, uh, we can see it uh, here. This, this object in this limit, Q to one, beta to infinity, and beta one minus Q equal to V tends to a finite limit, which is non-zero. And the limit is uh, alpha over two, one plus sigma square, I'll leave it as an exercise. Depending on this on this parameter v, and we have of course an equation for for v that comes from taking the same limit here. So v is not is not just a, a random number. It is a number that is fixed by this equation in the, in the very same limit, and the equation is in the very same limit. One equal to alpha v square, one plus sigma square divided by one plus v square. So if you if you solve this equation for v and you plug it in in here, you get a result for the average loss, minimal loss. And uh, the average minimal loss in this other regime, when the rectangularity index is larger than the critical value is one over two times the square of alpha one plus sigma square minus one, which is the same value that we had obtained using a random matrix calculations in our lecture number, number two. So what happens is that the minimal loss increases here, but it doesn't increase from, from one. It increases well before it. So under complete systems in the presence of nonlinear constraints are typically incompatible if, if the noise is strong enough. And, uh, and the loss of course increases with the rectangularity. So the more equation the more equations you have in the game, the more incompatible the system is, and it increases with the value of the noise. Okay, so that's that's the take-home message of this of this calculation: that in the presence of nonlinear constraints, even under complete systems may not be typically compatible. You cannot you cannot find a solution of this system, even if you have many more many more variables than equation. Okay, because they are constrained to live on the sphere. 
Okay, I can stop uh, here if there are questions, and then we we move to the last to the last part. Sorry, Pier Paolo. Yeah. Um, if I divide that guy over there after the um, the limit we have by beta, everything gets killed. So where? where sorry. Yeah, top right. Yes, right there. We have not divided by beta. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, this this is not the so so this is essentially a beta. Okay, okay. Times, times then, this object. Uh, yes. I, I just reported and probably this one. I, I just reported the final result after the the, the one over beta. Okay, okay. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Remember, you need to take this this guy and then take the limit beta to infinity of one over two beta. But but the two is included. Yes, I guess. So it's probably a two bit. So do, do simulations corroborate this replica prediction? How large must be n to observe a good approximation of that curve? Uh, I haven't done I haven't done numerical simulations. I guess yes. Uh, sorry. I guess yes. I uh, mean, if the, it testable quite easy. Uh, I think it is testable quite easy. I have I haven't done it personally, and uh, and I haven't seen it in. Uh, in the papers and in Rachel's thesis, but that I might be, I might have missed it, even even though I looked at it quite carefully. But uh, yeah, I think it is testable. Yes. I, I wonder if the spherical constraint is relaxed to a softer constraint where you say that the norm is less than one. I guess all that becomes a convex program, and it can be it can be solved uh, easily numerically. Uh, okay, so if you don't impose that the norm is strictly yes. equal to one, but it, is, it can be anything yes. up to one. Yes. Yes, I think probably um, uh, it becomes. Uh, uh, I'm also wondering what happens if you if you impose the equality only on. On average, like mm. that, that you're, that, that like you have like a softer constraint where your norm is n or it fluctuates, mm. fluctuates around n, and th there you will have another parameter, of course, which mm. is the 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 width of the fluctuations around around the radius. Mm. So, so you will you will have you you will get some sort of. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. All right, so let's start again at uh, 1040 sharp. Thanks. There is the coffee break. <laughs>